Along the side of a builder's yard in the Ari city of Limerick, there's a neglected track. It leads to a place which evokes terrible memories. I was shown one vast grave on the outskirts of the city, near the poorhouse, into which nearly 2,000 bodies had been gathered in less than a month. The cross stands on a mass grave, just one of thousands scattered all over Ireland. Such memorials bear stark testimony to one of the greatest tragedies in Irish history. Oh, no, I Somalia, 1993. At least 300,000 people died, most of them children. We may feel compassion and send a little money to charity, but these days famine is something which only afflicts brown people in faraway places. It hasn't happened in most of Europe for hundreds of years, except in Ireland, where events just as terrible, just as harrowing, took place only two lifetimes ago. Dead, uncoffined, naked, funerals consisting only of the cart driver and someone to help in putting the bodies into the grave. As for the little children, they seem to me to be all stunted in their growth and bearing as close a resemblance as possible to unfledged birds. The same morning, the police opened a house on the adjoining land, which was observed shut for many days, and two frozen corpses were found, lying upon the mud floor, half devoured by rats. But why should the Irish, alone of all the peoples in the Western world, have been so vulnerable to the horrors of famine? Part of the answer is that in 1845, a third of the population were entirely dependent on one crop, the potato. The climate in the west of Ireland is mild and wet, too wet for crops like wheat to do well. For thousands of years, a small population depended on oatmeal and cattle. But then came the wonder crop. <clears throat> the splendiferous spud, one of nature's greatest inventions, full of nutrition. It's got carbohydrate, it's got protein, it's got lots of vitamins. It's a bit weak on vitamin A, so we put in some buttermilk. Or if there's some greens handy, that will also do the job. A man can live on potatoes perfectly easily. And in the 19th century, in Ireland, the poor would eat up to 14 pounds of spuds a day. That's a stone. There was a problem with the potato, one problem, the problem of storage. Potatoes can only be stored for up to six months, or nine at a stretch. So that between May, when the harvest was exhausted, and October, when the new potatoes were coming in, the Irish went a bit hungry every year. There was a seasonal dearth of food in the summer. Despite the seasonal food shortage, the population more than doubled in less than a hundred years. 
By 1845, derelict hillsides like this one in County Mayo were teeming with people. The people have all gone and sheep have taken their place, but the potato ridges are still there. Those ridges would indicate tremendous pressure on the land because I think one has to be under great pressure to be up here at all, tilling this land. There's so much rock and there's so much stone. It certainly isn't the best land for cultivation, and yet there is intensive cultivation here. Um, all these plots of, of ridges and the height of those ridges, I think some of them were never dug out. There is an indication that crops were planted here and never gave any return. But the interesting thing is that in grassland and in the pastoral tradition, that you've had 200 generations of that. And then relatively recent in looking at the whole perspective of Irish agriculture, you had this wonder food which came in from America, the potato. It allowed for a tremendous crops to be taken off tiny plots of, uh, tiny plots of ridges. It gave this tremendous crop. It meant that you had a massive explosion of population, but then disaster hit. And possibly what we're looking at is that moment of disaster when this wonder crop showed that there was a negative side to it as well. There had been failures of the potato harvest before, but until the autumn of 1845, crop disease or bad weather had only affected some districts and had rarely lasted more than a single season. In September 1845, Farmers in many different districts all over Ireland noticed signs of a new disease on the leaves of the potato plants. It was blight, accidentally imported from America into Europe. Reports on the harvest from different parts of the country vary greatly. The disease is by no means as far spread as was supposed, and the crops so overabundant that the partial failure will be the less felt. Hunger will, I fear, soon commence among near one million of our people. The British government, which then controlled affairs all over Ireland, thought that the Irish were exaggerating as usual. But the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, knew Ireland well and was alert to the danger of famine. He set up a scientific commission to investigate the causes of blight and to try and find some remedy. But scientific knowledge wasn't far enough advanced and the Commission's recommendations were all useless. Ireland's population was then a booming nine million, with up to three million people utterly dependent on potatoes. Clearly, there was an urgent need for a substitute food. Maize was the cheapest available. It was known as Indian corn. Peel set up small stores of Indian corn in all the most impoverished districts. The idea wasn't to give it away, but to sell it at a low price and so keep down the cost of food. Irish grain merchants were enraged by this interference in free trade and complained bitterly about a threat to their profits. The problem for the poor was that they had no money with which to buy food at any price. So the government set up public works, where men could earn about eight pence a day, just enough to keep their families alive. The work should be as repulsive as possible, consistent with humanity. That is, paupers would rather do the work than starve. By labouring on the roads, and by selling the last of their possessions, most poor people survived one famished winter. They would not survive another. In the summer of 1846, there was fresh trouble about free trade in food. At the time, farmers in England and Eastern Ireland enjoyed high prices for grain because of heavy tariffs on foreign imports. Peel wanted to reform these corn laws and so reduce the price of food, but he was bitterly opposed by many landowners in his own party. He got the measure through, but his government fell and was replaced by the Liberals, then known as the Whigs. Even today, governments are all too ready to impose their economic policies 
as if they were some form of holy writ. That was certainly true in the summer of 1846, when the Whigs acceded to power. Their accession was a disaster for Ireland because it put responsibility for Irish affairs in the hands of men who believed passionately in free trade. They believed passionately in that trade and didn't want to meddle with market forces unless it were absolutely necessary. The new Whig Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, was a devotee of free trade and knew little of Irish affairs. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Charles Wood, was bigoted in his views. Many other English MPs also regarded private enterprise as sacrosanct and were rigidly opposed to government interference in the marketplace. I do not think the way to raise the condition of the people is to give relief from any public fund. It is clear that the Irish pauper does not like work. I object to the principle of taxing the people in this country to relieve the distress of Ireland. These were also the views of Charles Trevelyan, the civil servant in charge of Irish famine relief. He was devout, narrow-minded, and convinced that God and market forces were on the same side. He saw uh, the famine as uh, a visitation of God, uh, as a way of solving uh, a very serious overpopulation problem. And uh, he believed that by and large, uh, the government shouldn't intervene very much. Uh, because in the long run, that would uh, make things uh, even worse. If the Irish uh, weren't taught a lesson or didn't learn a lesson uh, in the late 1840s, then who knows, in the 1850s or the 1860s, uh, the same was going to happen again and they would have to go through perhaps even a worse catastrophe. Uh, now, that was the way uh, Trevelyan uh, thought. Uh, critics argued that uh, people who are starving needed food, not lessons in what was known in those days as political economy. Uh, Trevelyan was very well intentioned, but uh, uh, not a very humane man. And the, the atti his attitudes um, were responsible for, uh, undoubtedly, for uh, lots of debts. In the summer of 1846, the potato crop promised a bumper harvest, and many people believed the danger of famine was over. But they were wrong. On the 27th of last month, I passed from Cork to Dublin, and this doomed plant bloomed in all the luxuriance of an abundant harvest. Returning on the third instant, I beheld with sorrow one wide waste of putrefying vegetation. Before I saw the crop, I smelt the fearful stench, now so well recognized as the death sign of each field of potatoes. I saw my splendid crop fast disappearing and melting away under this fatal disease. Distress and fear was in every countenance. There was a great rush to dig and sell, or consume the crop by feeding pigs or cattle, fearing in a short time they would prove unfit for any use. For many months, the government refused to reopen the stores of Indian corn, convinced that nothing should disrupt the free market in food. The result was widespread starvation. I confess myself unmanned by the extent of the suffering I witnessed. More especially amongst the women and the little children, crowds of whom were seen to be scattered over the fields like a flock of famishing crows. Mothers uttering exclamations of despair, 
whilst the children were screaming with hunger. They passed through three stages. At first they faced starvation manfully, too proud to accept grudged help. Then they were mad with despair. Then they were full of hopeless resignation. The hunger is on us, tis the will of God. The will of God be done. Descriptions written at the time are haunting. But for me, what brings the famine closest is the fact that there are still people alive today whose grandparents survived the tragedy. A few of these old people, like Tom Guilty, remember the stories they first heard in childhood. They lived down here, Thomas McFadden. He walked across that mountain every day and watched for one turn up a day. And came home with a turn up at night. That man, he lived to be 101 years. He's buried over there in the graveyard. And he was one day on the Mayland Road with a cartload of potatoes. And there was a lot of women and kids begging a few of them. And he was throwing them a few, like here and there. And the landlord caught him. So the landlord put a different man the next day with the cart, his brother Dick. But there was ten times more people the next day waiting for Dick. And Dick's orders were to give no potatoes away. But um, they were all in the road and Dick couldn't get through. And they all gathered round the cart. And they tipped the load of potatoes up on the road and took the whole lot from Dick. Oh, the pretty they are small over here, over here. Oh, the pretty they are small over here. Oh, the praties, they are small, and we dig them in the fall, and we eat them skins and all. Over the famine affected the whole of Ireland, but it was most terrible in the West, where most people still spoke the Irish language. Bab Fertir tells the story of a poor woman who had just buried her daughter and then called on a neighbour's house. Oh, the pretties, they are small, and we dig them in the fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Irish people have always attached great importance to the ceremony surrounding death. But there were so many deaths at the time of the famine that wakes and funerals were forgotten and coffins almost unobtainable, even for a much-loved child. Tom was a child during the famine, of about two or three years old, and he got the famine fever, and they thought he was dead. So they were about to take him away and bury him without a coffin. But his aunt, who was very fond of the child, wouldn't allow that. She, she insisted that she should get something box to put him into. And she searched around, and eventually she got a box. But when she tried to put him into the box, she found his legs were too long. So she disjointed his two knees and turned his legs up beside his hips, you see, and got him into the box. He was buried then. And when the next funeral came to the place, they heard some noise in the box. And they opened it, and they found the child was alive inside. Goodness. And he was able to live, you see, because there was sufficient air in the box to keep him going until the next funeral came. But his legs never straightened again. He said himself, one of his legs faced east and the other faced west. You see, they were uh, about half a right angle out that way, and he walked on the side of his feet. But father dear, a day will come in answer to my call. When Irish men now fight again, 
and we'll rally one and all. As time went by, Irish people who might at first have accepted the famine as the will of God came increasingly to see it as caused by the British government. This old song cries out for vengeance. At the time of the famine, Ireland was technically part of the United Kingdom under the terms of the Act of Union of 1801. But despite the apparent prosperity of cities like Dublin, there was little industrial development and Ireland was effectively a British colony, a source of food and raw materials and a convenient market for English goods. Most of the wealth was in the hands of a small minority of Protestants. The Roman Catholics, who made up three quarters of the population, had suffered harsh discrimination for much of the previous 200 years. In many parts of the country, priests still sometimes say mass in the open air in memory of those times. Supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. Gave the cup to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It, it will be, be shed, shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Under the so-called penal laws, Irish Catholics weren't allowed to hold office in government. They couldn't buy or sell land. In theory, they couldn't even go to school unless they turned Protestant. By 1829, all these laws had been repealed, but by that time religious discrimination had come to be seen by many people as part of the hated colonial process. The Anglican Church of Ireland was only attended by about one-seventh of the population. Catholics resented the Church of Ireland because although they never entered its precincts, they were forced to help to pay for it. It was also, of course, the religion of the ruling classes. 80% of the land was in the hands of the Anglo-Irish gentry, the descendants of English adventurers who'd been granted lands in Ireland in the 17th century. This is Colonel John Brown, who was the founder of the estate here in about uh, 1690. And this is the marble staircase here, which was put in by Italians in about... Many landlords were absentees. Others were permanent residents. Some were brutal and arrogant. Others tried to be benevolent. But all of them lived in another world from the ordinary Irish people. And here is the Angel of Welcome, one of the most beautiful statues. And it was a tradition that if you've been away for a long time and you arrive back as one of the family, the first thing you do when you come into the house is to actually shake hands with the outstretched hand there of the angel. And up here especially you can see how the staircase is cantilevered. but it goes about... The evil of the system lay in the gross inequality in the distribution of land. Anglo-Irish landlords may have seemed all-powerful. A few of them were, but most sat at the top of a ramshackle pyramid of tenancies and sub-tenancies. The estates were often in debt, and most of the land was let on long leases to quite wealthy tenants. But at the bottom of the heap were hundreds of thousands of small sub-tenants. These usually rented their land from richer farmers from one year to the next, with no security, always in arrears with the rent. And these poor people tended to subdivide their land still further to make provision for their families. So you get uh, a dualistic uh, system where the better off farmers tend not to subdivide and so the uh, the inequality in the uh, distribution of land over time is becoming greater. Um, farms that are of 50 or 100 acres in say the year 1800 are still more or less like that in 1845 but farms of 10 acres many of them would have been divided into three of three acres or two of five acres or whatever.
Another difference uh, is that on the bigger farms, uh, people tend to marry later. And where subdivision is occurring, uh, you get uh, early marriage and more frequent marriage. What you have is a society where there was, in some areas, quite a lot of vacant land available, which was only under very loose control. And basically, access to land was relatively easy, much easier for a young person without capital than in Britain or in a lot of other parts of Northern Europe at the time. And the, the importance of that is that, first of all, people could marry and set, set up home at a relatively early age. Secondly, the size of holdings could become quite small. The result is that by the 1840s you have a lot of people in Ireland living on very, very small holdings of land. So you have a very strange picture in Ireland where there's almost an inverse relationship between land fertility and population density. In other words, a lot of the smallest plots of land are on the worst quality soil. Many of the poorest farmers lived close to the sea, where they could get access to seaweed to fertilize their potatoes. To some English observers, there was something immoral about living off potatoes, and the poor Irishman was an object of scorn. A fortnight's planting, a week or ten days digging, suffice for his existence. During the rest of the year, he is at leisure to follow his own inclinations. The whole of them, with a few exceptions, are idle, reckless, lazy and improvident. But although this dependence on potatoes may seem to have been foolish, the poor Irish had little choice. Potatoes gave the highest return from the smallest plots of land. Except in parts of the east, wheat was out of the question. And if Western farmers did raise a small plot of oats or barley, they almost always had to use it to pay the rent. A quarter of the population, well over two million people, survived by renting a plot of potatoes from year to year or by trading their labor for a small patch of land. These people lived in primitive cabins in the utmost squalor and poverty. As long as they were able to cut turf for their fires and had potatoes to eat, they could survive. In fact, they were surprisingly healthy and often had large families. This fecundity was one of many aspects of Irish rural life which offended the English. The Irish peasantry have a taste for rioting and whiskey, spend a large portion of their year on popish holidays, and the usual crimes and absurdities of itinerant and local treason. Who can wonder if Pat continues poor? But English visitors were appalled by the depths of Irish poverty. A bed or a blanket is a rare luxury, and their pig and their manure heap constitute their only property. Before the famine, the British government decided that something must be done about the poorest of the poor. 130 workhouses were built, where destitute people could take refuge at times of extreme want. The workhouses were paid for by rates levied on local landlords and tenant farmers. Conditions were made as harsh as possible to dissuade the Irish poor from sponging off the rates. They are led to their stalls for the night, where are pallets of straw in long rooms. They are sorted and ranged according to sex, to lie down together with neither light of the sun, moon, or candle till the morning dawn, to resume afresh the routine of the preceding day. As its name suggests, people were to work in the workhouse. They weren't to be idle. So men were usually set stone breaking. Women did the housework. The children went to school every day. The diet of the workhouse was deliberately to be monotonous and boring. And there was a strong disciplinary element as well. <laughs> 
Treasury Secretary Trevelyan put it like this. Relief should be made so unattractive as to furnish no motive to ask for it, except in the absence of every other means of subsistence. This was one of the isolation cells in the workhouse. People got thrown in here for having drink or maybe tobacco, or who knows, maybe for trying to kiss their wife. And they were thrown in here for two or three days. The door was shut. There was no light. It was dank. It was cold. And quite frankly, standing here, I myself feel a chill in the soul. Of course, the British didn't feel charitable towards the Irish who were seen as treacherous beggars, always ready to shoot their English benefactors in the back, constantly plotting rebellion. In some cases, they were regarded almost as subhuman. There's an element of racist scorn in many cartoons of the period. Nor were the Irish always as charitable as they might have been towards their own people. Throughout the famine, the richer Catholic farmers continued to sell their cattle for export to England, even though their poorer countrymen were starving all around them. A later generation of nationalists was to see this as an example of deliberate English exploitation. In fact, it was just the unrestrained pursuit of profit. There was nothing to stop that food staying in Ireland. Um, it would have stayed in Ireland, presumably, if the farmers in question had got a higher price on the local markets than they got on the export market. Uh, nobody forced the food to leave the country. It didn't have to leave the country to pay rents either. Um, there was a common currency between the two countries. The rent could have been paid by food sold in Dublin just as well by food sold in Liverpool. Um, the reason the food didn't stay in Ireland is because the people who were starving didn't have the wherewithal to buy this food. Now, the alternative would have been for the government to compulsorily buy the food in the markets, but that would have caused a similar process of objection by the people selling it, who were mostly Irish, who were mostly Catholic, who were, by and large, not the landlords. They were the farmers. They were the middling ranks in Irish society. And they obviously wanted to get the maximum market price for what they were selling. If the government had paid maximum market prices, it would, it would have been a matter of indifference to them. The Whig government also refused to interfere with the free market in wheat, barley and oats. Although there were large imports of maize, wheat continued to be exported to England throughout the famine, to the understandable fury of many Irish people. There had been crop failures throughout Europe, but other governments, Belgium, Russia, Alexandria, were importing food. They were um, closing their ports to export, and they were actually providing bounties for food imported into their countries. The British government refused to do that, and it very much left Ireland to free market forces. Unrestrained free trade meant that food was openly on sale at very high prices to those who could afford it, within full sight of the starving people. This seems to me to be the ultimate obscenity of British government policy in the late 1840s. At the same time, thousands of people were dying of hunger. They went on the shore and every rock and every, every place you'd go was turned over with uh, looking for limpids and winkles. They had at everything. And then they started eating the seaweed, chopping it up and boiling it. And they died with dysentery and black fever and Stalatine fever and yellow fever. They were dying every day, like. The weather that winter was the worst on record. It was described as one continuous storm. So rude is their tackle, and so fragile and liable to be upset are their primitive boats, that they can only venture to sea in fine weather. And thus, with food almost in sight, the people starve. Not a fish was to be had in the town. Not a boat was at sea. 
After much delay, the government restarted the public works. This is a famine road in the Dingle Peninsula, and it's flanked by a wonderful wall. We know from some reports that men on the works dropped dead. They were starving, they were wretchedly dressed, and they were paid a pittance for their work, a pittance which sometimes never even arrived. Here we know that there was a ganger who was reasonably humane and allowed the men to go down to the shore to pick mussels and other shellfish. And some of these mussels are still lying on the road here today. The system, uh, as it operated in some places, tended to benefit uh, the strong and those who could work at the expense of those who couldn't. Um, and uh, in that sense, it was an inefficient uh, way of uh, providing relief. Again, it involved people working out in the open uh, in bad, bad clothes, in bad weather and so on. And that is not an ideal way of dealing with uh, people who are on the brink of dying. There was no other government relief available, so the Board of Works ended up by taking on women, old folk, even children. By February 1847, 750,000 people were employed and many of them had several dependents. But wages were rarely more than eight pence a day. And with no restriction on food prices, the cheapest Indian corn rose to three pence a pound. While they worked, the people were slowly starving to death. What they were paid was probably adequate to keep a family alive in, say, September, October. By January, what they were paid was no longer adequate to buy sufficient food for that family. Yes, maybe you could pay them more, but the more you paid, the more you were taking people out of ordinary, everyday jobs, farm labourers, work, uh, work in the local towns, etc. I think basically the shock to the system, what happened in terms of food prices meant the public works didn't have a chance. In the spring of 1847, the public works were brought to an abrupt halt. This is a pile of stones that were going to be used to build a road. And they lie exactly where they left them 150 years ago. Some of the projects were good, others were futile. This was one of the futile ones. It would have been a road from nowhere to nowhere. When the public works were brought to an end, poor people had little hope of survival on the land. Some of their landlords did nothing. Others tried to help. He did everything he could, we believe, under the circumstances, to help in every way possible. Uh, he brought in a ship at the quay with grain on it for distribution. He kept the workhouse going uh, at his own expense, in fact, for quite a long time. He traveled the 26 counties, or 26 of the counties of Ireland. Uh, consulting with all the appropriate people, trying to see if something could be done about the famine. And also, uh, they had a lot of guns and a lot of shot at that time when the famine begun, began itself. And uh, they went off over the hills, over the deer park, and they shot all the birds and the deer that they could shoot. And they brought them down into the great big enormous famine pots, which they boiled up great soups with and they had lines of people that they gave out the soup to. From the early days of the famine, some local relief committees and private charities like the Society of Friends, the Quakers, ran soup kitchens where starving people were fed. The Mendicity Society in Dublin 
still serves free meals to all comers, with no questions asked, just as it did at the time of the famine. Efforts like this finally roused Westminster into effective action, and by the summer of 1847, government soup kitchens were feeding three million people a day. But by then it was too late for the hundreds of thousands who had already died. In a desperate search for food, thousands of starving people poured into the towns. Here in Skibbereen was a government food store and a locally organized soup kitchen. The poor people came in from the rural districts in such numbers in the hope of getting some relief that it was utterly impossible to meet their most urgent exigencies. Any day that you would have come to this town in the winter of 1846-47, you would have seen approximately 8,000 people gathered here outside the soup kitchen which stands behind me. Now, 8,000 people mightn't sound like much, but today, when 8,000 people go over there to the football pitch, we say there's a huge crowd in town. Here we're talking about 8,000 starving people coming in for food. Furthermore, the soup committee were sending out as many as 700 servings per day up to a distance of four miles out of town to those who actually couldn't come in because they hadn't the strength. In every famine, far more people die of disease than die of hunger alone. And when people flock in from the countryside in search of food, the danger of epidemics is greatly increased. This is as true today as it was in 1847. In the Ethiopian famine of 1984, great care was taken to try and ensure clean water supplies to prevent dysentery. The medical teams also had modern disinfectants and antibiotics for the treatment of disease. Even so, relief workers found that Ethiopian children in 1984 suffered from exactly the same diseases as the Irish children of 1847. Typhus is spread by a louse, an infected louse. And of course, as happened in the Irish famine, I understand, we had a lot of debilitated people gathered together. Their clothes were dirty and their head were full of lice. And people who are sick and cold huddled together for warmth. And of course, that caused a, a lot of the spread of the infection at the time. So we were very concerned about the high numbers of people gathered together. I've read quite a bit about the famine, and the thing that continues to amaze me is the similarity. I mean, the diseases were exactly the same. Bacillary dysentery, typhus, pneumonia, and I'm certain, although I, I haven't read much about iron deficiency anemia, but I'm absolutely certain that anemia was gross in Ireland at that time. I don't know if much has been written about that, but I mean, it's a very important factor because it predisposed people to the various infections were going. The workhouses, which had been shunned before the famine, were now besieged by thousands of people begging for admission. Inevitably, the places of refuge became hotbeds of infection. Five hundred persons were admitted without any provision either of space or clothing to meet so fearful an emergency. All of them were suffering from famine and most of them from malignant dysentery or fever. Such a tangled mass of poverty, filth and disease as the applicants presented, I have never seen. Numbers in all stages of fever and smallpox and all clamoring for admission. The great majority of new admissions are when brought into the house at the point of death, in a moribund state. It is a well-known fact that many dying persons are sent for admission merely that coffins be obtained for them at the expense of the Union. By the autumn of 1847, many workhouses were running out of money to feed and house, or even to bury, their wretched occupants. At this point, the British government washed its hands of the Irish problem. It brought in a new measure to make Irish property pay for Irish poverty. It was called the Poor Law Extension Act. 
and was the brainchild of Treasury Secretary Trevelyan. Trevelyan believed that Ireland's estates must be made more profitable, which meant getting rid of inefficient or debt-ridden landlords, like Major Dennis Mann, the owner of Strokestown Park. When Mann inherited the estate, it was £30,000, say between two and three million pounds at today's prices, in debt. From my own reading of the family's papers, it's obvious that Mann was in an impossible situation. None of his thousands of tenants had paid any rent for years. They were under threat not to do so from Molly Maguire's, the 1840s equivalent of paramilitary gangs. But the government's new act now made landlords responsible for the rates of all their poorer tenants. Mann himself was assassinated before the new act became law, but the problem remained for his successors. How could landlords pay the rates for thousands of poor tenants who were no longer paying them any rent? The answer was to evict them and destroy their houses. This was a brutal, almost a murderous business, but it wasn't entirely the landlord's fault. The effect of the government's new act was to force many landlords to evict all their poorer tenants or else go bankrupt. Other people on the estate were forbidden to shelter evicted tenants because if the homeless people remained on his land, the landlord would still be liable for their rates. The ditch side, the dripping rain and the cold sleet are the covering of the wretched outcast the moment the cabin is tumbled over him. No country ravaged by a hostile army could have been reduced to a more deplorable condition. Whole districts are cleared. The torpor and apathy which have seized on the people are only surpassed by the atrocities committed by those who set the dictates of humanity and the decree of the Almighty at equal defiance. At least a million people died before the famine ran its course. The great majority of them Roman Catholics. They died in conditions of abject misery and degradation. For many of them, the only consolation was the Christian promise of life everlasting. It must have been that faith which enabled them in the end to face death with such extraordinary submissiveness. They passed through three stages at first, they faced starvation manfully, too proud to accept grudged help. Then they were mad with despair. Then they were full of hopeless resignation. The hunger is on us. Tis the will of God. The will of God be done. St. Patrick's Day, New York. Forty million Americans claim Irish descent and today's the day when they march through the city, celebrating their roots and showing off their achievement as one of the largest and richest communities in the United States. Some of these people are the descendants of Irish immigrants who first came here 150 years ago, hungry and in rags. Today, their descendants are so successful that members of many other communities are happy to be Irish for the day. But among the throng of people having a good time are a few who harbour bitter memories of exile and pain, of British injustice and oppression back in the old country. Many of those memories begin with the terrible events of the Great Famine. London Times wrote, they are going, they are going with the vengeance, the Celts are going. 
Pretty soon a Celt on the streets of Dublin will be as rare as an Indian on the streets of Manhattan. This is something that England can never let down. They allowed these people to die by the millions. They shipped them out of the country, anything, get rid of them. The landlords even shipped them out. They, there were so many of them died, they had no place to bury them. The mounds, you can still go and find a little field, a little in, uh, in the countryside. They had bottoms in the casket so they could just drop them out. Children died at their mother's breasts, and who cared? A hundred and fifty years ago, Ireland's potato crop, the staple diet of millions of people, was destroyed by blight. In the years of famine which followed, a million men, women and children died of starvation and disease. The people cried out for food, but the British government, which ruled all Ireland at the time, was miserly and slow with famine relief, and determined to protect the rights of property and profit, whatever the cost in human suffering. Death is in every hovel. Disease and famine have fastened on the young and old, the mother and the infant. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to feel compassion for the Irish peasants when the famine struck. Life was always very difficult for them. Their religion was reviled, their native language and culture despised. There was always the possibility of eviction. And then came the potato blight. It looked like the end of the road. But for some of the lucky ones, there was one last resort, emigration. The richer tenant farmers were often the first to go. The obvious strength of the country is departing. It's the industrious and enterprising who are leaving us. Let me go to the land of liberty. Let me see no more of the tithe man and tax man. Poorer people soon followed. In place of starvation, America offered hopes of prosperity and full bellies. Sorrow at leaving home came second to the need to survive. Despite the pain of separation and fears of life in a strange land, emigration seemed the only hope. For just a few pence, it was possible to get a passage on one of the new steamships which plied across the Irish Sea to ports in Scotland, Wales and England. Three hundred thousand people came to Liverpool in 1847 alone. The first immigrants who came perhaps were the better off ones, but increasingly as the famine bit, the emigrants were poorer. A lot of them were ridden, um, had fever, and they were obviously not welcome because they were a burden on the local taxpayers. And unfortunately, 1847, there was a recession in England. So it actually coincided with a period of high unemployment in Britain. And who are these paupers coming from Ireland expecting poor relief? So the sympathy, public sympathy, turned very quickly to wanting to get rid of the problem. It was seen as a problem. And what is interesting is the port authorities in Liverpool and Glasgow, Cardiff, elsewhere, repeatedly asked the government to control the problem, to introduce some sort of fever legislation, to do something. And the government said they could not intervene. Despite British hostility, hundreds of thousands of poor Irish people stayed on, joining earlier generations of immigrants in the overcrowded slums. Many died of fever, but many more survived. And within five years of the famine, there were three quarters of a million Irish-born people in mainland Britain. But for well over a million Irish emigrants, Britain wasn't far enough. They were determined to go to America, and in the spring of 1847, this old key in Cork was thronged with thousands of people desperate to get away. America was the favorite destination, but passage to Canada was cheaper. And in 1847, almost 100,000 people opted for British North America. Many passengers were already infected with fever. They were supposed to undergo a medical inspection, 
but there were too few doctors for the multitude of emigrants. Everywhere there was panic and confusion. They're running away from fever, disease and hunger, with money scarcely sufficient to pay passage for and find food for the voyage. When they eventually got on board, it must have seemed that the worst was over. A Quaker who witnessed peasants embarking for America wrote in his diary, there was nothing but joy at their escape as if from a doomed land. God help them, they didn't know what horrors awaited them once they set sail. The departure itself was often jubilant, with people thronging the decks to say goodbye. Even the congested hold must have seemed exciting at first, but within a few days the appalling overcrowding made itself felt. Hundreds of poor people, men, women and children of all ages, from the driveling idiot of 90 to the babe just born, huddled together, without light, without air, wallowing in filth and breathing a fetid atmosphere, sick in body, dispirited in heart, living without food or medicine, except as administered by the hand of casual charity, dying without spiritual consolation. Typhus, spread by body lice, ran amuck among the passengers stacked in the bunks, sometimes were four or five to one bunk. And then, of course, there was dysentery caused by the total lack of sanitation. This, this was the toilet. When the weather was bad, the passengers were battened down, the hatches were closed, and sometimes they were on the deck for a few days or even, even for a few weeks. One need not think too hard to imagine the horror of those days. It was a sort of hell, a hell at sea, if not a hell on earth. The voyage could take anything from six weeks to three months. Some ships were old coasters and timber vessels brought into the trade by greedy speculators. Others were well built and well supplied, but conditions on board were still extremely harsh. The desire to reach America being extremely strong, many of the emigrants were content to submit to very great hardships during the voyage. We were all seasick, not a man on board was free. We were all confined unto our bunks, and no one to pity poor me. No father kind, nor mother dear, to lift up my head. It was so, which made me think more of the lassie I left on Paddy's green sham rock shore. For far too many of the Irish emigrants, the first landfall was Grosse Isle, the quarantine station for Quebec, where all vessels with fever on board were obliged to stop. Sick passengers had to be landed on the island where they would have to stay until they died or had been declared free of infection. The regulations were strictly enforced, but in 1847, many of the ships at anchor under the guns were carrying the bodies of people who'd already died at sea. There was a continuous line of boats, each carrying its freight of dead to the burial ground and forming an endless funeral procession. From one ship, a boat proceeded four times during the course of the day, each time laden with a cargo of dead. The main cause of the death, of course, was the disease. And uh, you had good captains, you had bad captains, you had good ships, you had bad ships. And you had ships that provided good food and some that provided not so good food. But basically, if the, if the immigrants were healthy when they boarded the ships, they could survive. And uh, it was so, the, the, the high death rates came, of course, on ships where you had fever breaking out. Uh, and, of course, the fever was the main cause of death. With thousands of sick and dying people to cope with, 
conditions on the pretty island soon became atrocious. The medical superintendent, Dr. Douglas, pleaded for money for new hospital buildings to replace the overcrowded fever sheds. These were very miserable, so slightly built as to exclude neither the heat nor the cold. I have known poor families prefer to burrow under heaps of stone on the shore rather than accept the shelter of the infected sheds. In this building behind us, apparently there were, there were double-decker bunks and um, one can picture the various accidents that occur when you're sick and, and the poor people in the lower bunk suffering from somebody's misery above. So there's, there are conditions, the, the overcrowding, the numbers of people, it's bad enough if one person is, or one family is enduring uh, misery and sickness and the death, but when you're surrounded by, by it, uh, the doctors and those in who still had the priests who still had some elements of of, of strength and, and health about them, they themselves must have suffered from watching the terrible conditions under which people existed. Douglas at one point says that the things are so bad that he has to put two in a bed and that uh, he quotes at one point, these people are so indifferent to life that they'll even lie alongside a corpse without, without any emotion or without, without showing any, any signs of, of fear or revulsion. They're, they've been reduced to such a terrible condition. 5,400 Irish people are said to be buried on Gros Isle. Some historians believe there are many more. Those who escaped quarantine often took fever with them as they fled up the rivers. Many thousands more were to die before the survivors found refuge in the countryside or crossed the border into the United States. Altogether, something approaching one-fifth, up to 20,000 of the 1847 immigrants to Canada, died before they could complete their journey. A few joined relatives in the countryside where they could find work on the land. Others were too poor or sick to travel and stayed in the slums of the ports where they'd landed, like St. John, New Brunswick, where an Irish quarter quickly developed down by the quays. Some immigrants began to regret that they'd ever come. This place is different from our opinions at home, bad and all as we were in Ireland. I often wished we'd never seen St. John. The quarantine station for St. John was Partridge Island. The local authorities resented being used as a dumping ground for Irish paupers. They landed in the greatest misery and destitution, so broken down and emaciated by starvation, disease and the fatigues of the voyage as to be in great measure incapable of performing sufficient labour to earn a subsistence. One particular case, uh, the vessel Aeolus had made two voyages to St. John in 1847, um, brought approximately a thousand immigrants in total. Uh, a large number of them were ill and several hundred died from, from those two uh, voyages. And uh, I suppose the, the bubble burst for St. John uh, on that second voyage uh, at the end of the immigrant season in November when Common Council actually passed a resolution asking for the government to basically send all these Irish back to Ireland. Um, we don't want them, we don't need them, we can't afford them. Uh, so let's get rid of them and send them back. To the government's credit, of course, uh, that didn't happen and uh, they weren't sent back. The Eolus, the ship which brought so much misery and death to St. John, was carrying per tenants from Lord Palmerston's estate. The great British statesman was also an absentee Irish landlord. His lordship was anxious to clear his estate of unprofitable tenants, and his agents had paid for their transportation. Other landlords, like the Marquis of Sligo, behaved very generously at first. But as the financial burdens increased, 
they began to evict their tenants and turn them off their estates to seek such relief as they could find or starve by the roadside. This wholesale extermination of entire communities wasn't altogether the fault of the landlords. In 1847, the British government made Irish landlords responsible for the rates, the local taxes, of all their poor tenants. Many of the landlords were in debt, and their tenants were no longer paying any rent. Such landlords faced a stark choice, evict their tenants or go bankrupt themselves. To blame landlords for the famine is a, is a great oversimplification. It's uh, just, it will not wash. Uh, some landlords did what they could and, and crashed, uh, lost all they had, and others behaved uh, very cruelly. Uh, the ones who behaved badly, of course, uh, get written up, like uh, Lord Lucan, uh, Vandalor in Kilrush, uh, Lord Sligo. Um, and Lord Leitrim gets, uh, uh, gets mentioned as well. Uh, but um, the trouble is that about one-fifth or one-quarter of uh, landed property uh, changed hands because of people going bankrupt. Uh, and had landlords spent every penny they had, there still would have been a problem. So the, uh, Putting the burden on Irish landed property uh, in 1847 was not a feasible uh, way of uh, dealing with famine relief. The landlord's church, the Church of Ireland, was also blamed for exploiting the poor during the famine. Protestants were later persecuted in some areas, and their churches gradually fell into decay. The problem here was called superism and it arose from the belief that some Anglican pastors forced Catholics to convert to Protestantism in exchange for food. You can still find memorials in some areas which keep alive the belief that Catholics preferred to die rather than take the soup. In enduring memory of the numerous heroes of West Clare who died rather than pervert in the Great Famine and who were buried here coffinless in three large pits. Taking the soup was seen as treachery by the Catholics. It was, in Irish, what was called cool akin. It was, they were abandoning their own people as much as their faith. Um, yes, it is hard for us to understand it. I know there was a certain amount of persecution of the people who became converts. They were called supers, and that nickname, super, is, is still used around the country as an insult. As a synonym for somebody who betrays the cause? Yes, um, a traitor, um, uh, someone who, uh, an apostate, someone who abandoned the faith for the sake of soup. But um, I would say that at the same time that there were very few Protestant clergymen who um, would deny food to a Catholic unless he became Protestant. I think that would have happened very, very seldom if at all. In fact, charitable relief for the poor of both faiths was often distributed by Church of Ireland clergymen, and many of them became infected with typhus fever while visiting the sick. Dr. Trail of Skull did great work during the famine, and he was never accused of interfering in religion by the Catholics at all. Um, he is really a classic example of a Protestant clergyman who did heroic work during the famine and paid for it with his life. The problem was that a few years before the famine, a group of evangelical Protestants had started free schools for poor Catholic children in remote areas, giving away food along with dollops of the Bible. This enraged some Catholic clergy. It would be better to cut your children's throats with a knife than to send them to such schools. One such school was run by Edward Nangle, an evangelical Protestant, openly committed to converting Catholics, who started a mission to Achill Island before the famine began. He built a so-called colony in the village of Dugort, complete with a dispensary, an evangelical newspaper and a soup kitchen. 
Today, there are very few Protestants left on Akil, and some Catholics still believe that Nangal forced Catholics to change their faith by bribing them with soup. And then in ages dreary, Nangal bold apostle came to corrupt the sick and weary, soup and brachan to proclaim. <laughs> brachan is the, the soup. It's kind of a scotch broth. Uh, yeah. They made out of turnips, another thing that boiled them in a big pot. And uh, you'd have to turn a Protestant to get any of Nangal's soup. He came like on a difficult mission to establish a Protestant community among a Catholic community. True or false, the great soup controversy served the Catholic Church well. Many Catholics, whose faith had been lukewarm before the hunger began, turned to the church with renewed fervor after the famine, perhaps because some clergy encouraged the belief that the famine was a punishment for their sins. It is a calamity with which God wishes to purify the Irish people. In the years following the famine, the Catholic faith slowly became more and more identified with Irish nationalism. But in 1847, nationalism was at a low ebb. The great Daniel O'Connell, whose monster rallies against the union with Britain had once inspired thousands, died the same year on a pilgrimage to Rome. Now, nationalist politics were divided between supporters of O'Connell's son, John, and supporters of a new group of Irish militants called Young Ireland. One of them, Charles Gavin Duffy, became editor of their newspaper, The Nation, which grew increasingly radical as the famine continued its ravages. In 1848, inspired by revolutions all over Europe, the editors called for armed rebellion. A revolutionary social change has become indispensable. The last gaspings of a thousand, thousand human beings have commanded it. Smith O'Brien, himself a landlord from an old Irish family, reluctantly took responsibility for leading the armed rebellion. On July the 30th, 1848, he and another young islander, James Stevens, found themselves besieging this farmhouse in County Tipperary at the head of a rabble of half-starved men. A squad of the Royal Irish Constabulary had taken refuge behind the barricaded windows. The rebels outnumbered the police, but they were ill-armed and completely untrained. They took shelter behind the garden wall, firing their antiquated guns and hurling rocks at the windows. Smith O'Brien finally decided to set fire to some buildings at the back of the house to try and smoke the policemen out. But then the owner of the house, a certain Widow McCormack, arrived home to find a battle going on. She immediately told Smith O'Brien to stop the fighting, as five of her seven children were inside the house. O'Brien was not the man to ignore a mother's appeal. He called on his men to cease firing while he tried to persuade the police to surrender. At this moment of extreme tension, Smith O'Brien came round the corner here to the front of the house to negotiate with the police. He came to this window and stuck his arm over the barricade. Unfortunately, at that very moment, one of his men hurled a stone at the window and the police upstairs immediately opened fire and loosed a volley into the crowd of insurgents. The insurgents fled. It was the end of the young Islanders' war effort, but not of their idealism. Smith O'Brien borrowed the police inspector's horse and rode away. He was arrested at a railway station a few days later while trying to catch a train home. O'Brien was imprisoned, but James Stevens, who had later found the Irish Republican Brotherhood, escaped and joined the flood of refugees leaving the country. Ireland's long struggle for independence often sank into failure, even absurdity, but it always resurfaced and many of the young Ireland leaders eventually escaped from imprisonment and joined the great exodus across the Atlantic to the United States. This mass emigration, one and a half million people left Ireland between 1847 and 1851, was without doubt the single most important outcome of the Great Famine. 
For the hundreds of thousands of Irish emigrants who crossed the Atlantic in the mid-1800s, America was the great dream, the dream of freedom, the land of promise, the land of hope. And New York was the supreme goal. It was the Mecca. Most of the Irish who came here probably didn't know very much about America, but they did know one thing, and that one thing was very important. They knew that the Americans had got rid of the British, and that must have been a great attraction. The main point of entry for the famine immigrants was South Street Quay on Manhattan Island. There's never been anything like it in American history before this. The whole idea of us as an immigrant nation begins in this place, really with the Irish immigrants who come through because they're not just um, immigrants, they're essentially foreign to the people who were living here in New York. They're, they're Catholic, many of them don't speak English, uh, and they are perceived as essentially foreign. The great debate in the United States about the reception of foreigners begins here. When they get off these boats and come down onto the ground, they find people waiting for them who uh, posed as people willing to help them. They were called runners, and they were taking their luggage. They would bring them to rooming houses, and the idea was to fleece them of everything they had before they got 100 yards into Manhattan. There were almost no government control of immigration at that time. So that they, were, they thought the end of their journey was, was here. In many ways, this was the beginning of it. This is a sanitized version of 19th century New York. You would have to imagine, you'd have the horse droppings in the street, you'd have privies overrunning, you'd have whorehouses, you'd have taverns, you'd have hotels for sailors, jammed with people, a crowded, noisy, dirty place. And what sort of prejudices and exclusions did they find here? Well, they find that the whole country begins to organize. Their immigration is in such a volume, and they're in such a um, disastrous condition, many of them, when they come here, that there's a whole, it's called a nativist movement in America to stop the Irish immigration into the United States. The largest third party political movement in American history is the Know Nothing Party, which is organized specifically to stop the Irish immigration into the United States. This feeling that with the country is being overwhelmed by this alien group that will never be assimilated. The living conditions of the Irish poor in New York shocked Protestant Americans. We could tell of one room, 12 feet by 12, in which were five resident families their condition far exceeded the limit of all previously conceived ideas of human degradation and suffering. They could be turned out of their squalid lodgings with even less ceremony than in Ireland. And for many years the poor Irish were regarded as inherently dishonest, the most likely candidates for prison or the lunatic asylum. The American Civil War began the process of acceptance. Irish soldiers fought bravely on both sides, and the army made an ideal recruiting ground for the Fenians, a new movement founded by John O'Mahony, a former member of Young Ireland. In the late 1860s, the Fenians decided to launch a rebellion in Ireland itself. Once there, the Irish-American Civil War veterans must have looked pretty conspicuous. They were easily spotted by government spies, and many were soon rounded up and imprisoned. Undeterred, their leader, Colonel Kelly, launched a nationwide insurrection on the night of March the 6th, 1867. Here in Temple Road in the leafy suburbs of South Dublin, about 500 Fenians gathered. It was dreadfully cold, it was snowing, it was very dark. And instead of moving on central Dublin, they went out beyond here to a place called Talla, and they were followed by the police, the army knew what was happening, and they were rounded up. About 200 prisoners were taken. It looked like a complete fiasco. But the heavy sentences handed out by the British courts had a great impact on Irish public opinion. People who previously hadn't shown any interest in the Fenians now threw their weight behind the Fenians and their cause. It was a new beginning. The movement really took off when a band of Fenians held up the prison van carrying Colonel Kelly to jail in Manchester. Unfortunately, in the course of the struggle, an unarmed police sergeant was shot dead. Several alleged Fenians were arrested and tried for murder. A lot of the evidence was flimsy, circumstantial, but three men, Allen, Larkin and O'Brien, were found guilty. Irish public opinion swung round on their side and turned them into heroes. When they were hanged, 
that three men became martyrs. They're still revered as martyrs. This memorial in Kilrush is one of several similar monuments in different parts of Ireland, where the sacrifices made by some of the early nationalists are proudly remembered. The story of the three men and their heroism is part of nationalist mythology. The power of that mythology, especially where the famine was concerned, was put to work by the son of an Ulster Presbyterian minister, John Mitchell. He was a former member of Young Ireland, an ardent nationalist with a passionate hatred of the British. Mitchell was a master of the telling phrase of the carefully calculated exaggeration. One and a half million men, women and children were carefully, prudently and peacefully slain by the English government. The Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. Mitchell blamed everything on the British, relieving the Irish of any responsibility for their actions. And you can hear his words on the lips of Irish nationalists to this day. A government ship sailing into any harbour with Indian corn was sure to meet half a dozen sailing out with Irish wheat and cattle. In other words, Ireland had plenty of food, but it was all exported to England, so the Irish starved. But Mitchell was wrong. Exports of food continued because the government refused to interfere with free trade. But apart from a terrible few weeks at the beginning of the famine, far more grain flowed into Ireland than out of it. One of the, the stock folk images uh, of the famine is cartloads and uh, barge loads of grain uh, moving east and uh, uh, of course, uh, grain continued to be exported during the famine, but far more grain was imported. I mean, the, the balance of trade in grain was uh, adverse and uh, very markedly so during the famine period. Uh, but of course, uh, the grain imported was of low quality. It tended to be uh, Indian meal or maize, whereas uh, what was exported was oats and, and wheat. Um, but the only period in which there would have been an excess of exports over imports would have been uh, at the very beginning in uh, late 46 and early 47 and that is because of course the maize uh, took a while to arrive from distant shores. <laughs> The pattern of emigration set up by the famine continued, and Mitchell himself eventually joined the throng of Irish immigrants who went on pouring into the United States throughout the second half of the 19th century. The later arrivals found a far warmer welcome than the famine immigrants, but many of them still felt that they'd been forced into exile by the hated British, and they took these beliefs with them to their new country. The liberating climate of the United States made many Irish immigrants all the more determined to back independence for the old country. America enabled them to see that freedom and democracy for Ireland was a real possibility. Some Irish Americans still seem to be more Irish than the Irish themselves. Caught in a kind of historical time warp, their anti-colonial attitudes frozen far back in the past. Even after 50 years in America, Paddy Reynolds still swears by John Mitchell's dictum that the English created the famine. I think that they contributed to the debt of about four and a half million Irishmen, women and children. And for that they should pay. Whatever way that is possible. They did contribute to it. And they did help to, to keep it going. What could they have done that they didn't do to alleviate the suffering? And they could of the have people? supplied us with the food that was necessary. The question that always enters my mind is they uh, the potato crop allegedly failed. 
blight-headed. What happened to the wheat, oats, barley, rye, and other grain crops that was in the shipyards of Ireland, Dublin and Belfast and Sligo, on its way out to the Crimea to, to feed British troops, while the people in Ireland were dying with starvation? They didn't even try to save their lives, they contrived it to do it. They allowed them to die. It was a complete genocide of the Irish people. I doubt in my mind the British were mainly responsible. Ethnic cleansing of this century. If a native government had been in charge in Ireland, the people would not have starved. God's curse upon you, Lord John Russell. May your black heart soul rot in hell. There's no love left on earth. For a younger generation of Irish Americans, Larry Cohen's passionate Black 47 punches home the message that the English were responsible. So it's hardly surprising that ever since the days of the famine, some Irish Americans have been willing to finance Irish nationalists in their struggles against Britain. Well, certainly in the famine, the lesson that was taught there was a lesson learned in the United States long ago, the lesson learned in so many countries around the world is that ultimately for the British to go, for people to have national freedom, uh, force was the only argument that the British ultimately listened to. So it's legitimate to pour money into the IRA? I don't pour money into the IRA. Uh, Irish Northern Aid gives money to the families of Irish political prisoners. But I understand why there was conflict in 1920 and 1916. Uh, there was conflict in the Fenian times, where there was conflict at the present time because of the nature of British rule. It's a conflict that had been forced upon the Irish people. Senator Edward Kennedy, himself the great-grandson of a famine emigrant, was one of the first to extend a welcome to the Sinn Féin leader, Jerry Adams, during his publicity tours of the United States. When the final history is uh, written, uh, there will be the names of many extraordinary men and women who have been a part of this process over many years, trying to move the process of peace forward. Uh, but one of the names that will be there will be the name of Jerry Adams, who has been a, a courageous leader in advancing the cause of, of peace uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. In striving to achieve a just and lasting peace in Northern Ireland, the British government might do well to consider the legacy of its misdeeds in the past. At the time of the famine, it was not so much what the British government did, but what it failed to do, which still rankles with many Irish people. My own feeling is that the British could have done more to help the Irish and should have done more to help them. But they were hooked on a doctrinaire policy of not interfering with market forces. At the same time, I think it would be a mistake to concentrate too much on that blame because that could have the effect of deflecting attention from the many lessons which can be extracted from the famine. Some of those lessons have to do with the whole way that the Great Famine is being commemorated in Ireland today. All over the country, local committees are organizing events and refurbishing old famine burial grounds. No one is suggesting that there's anything wrong with commemoration as such, but the issues are not always as straightforward as first appears. Part of this is to evoke uh, an image of people in Ireland today uh, as some kind of uh, community of famine victims. But of course, uh, those of us who uh, are around today uh, descend less from the victims than the survivors. And uh, this kind of uh, approach also, I think, uh, risks letting us forget that the famine was also a time when a lot of Irish people were cruel to other Irish people. Lots of horrible things happened. Uh, neighbor fought against neighbor. Probably some members of a family 
uh, survived at the expense of other members. These are all aspects which I think are cause for thought uh, and should not be uh, brushed under the carpet uh, in, the, uh, in the commemoration. Uh, the, the, the image evoked is of eight million people, all of whom are somehow equally at risk uh, and uh, equally victims and uh, history doesn't support that kind of interpretation. The truth is that some of the more successful Catholic farmers were just as anxious as the Protestant landowners to clear their land of unprofitable tenants and make way for cattle or sheep. It's not a random process who survived the famine. As a simple rule, if you had about 20 acres of land, you had a good chance of coming through. If you had less than 20 acres, you had not a very good chance of coming through. So the haves, or those who had a little, survived. The have-nots perished. And that raises certain questions. And those who had sometimes perhaps didn't, didn't share. help, didn't yeah, share. Yeah. Is that possible? It's very possible. We don't know enough about it. But, I mean, what we are told, for example, is that ancient Irish traditions of hospitality, that anyone who came to the door was fed, I mean, that, that they suffered. And you can see why, because it's not even just the food. They might have been bringing fever with them. Uh, so there, there are problems about that, which uh, would have been very difficult for the people of the time. Documents of the period suggest that while some Irish people were generous and self-sacrificing, Others held on to their property and left the poor to die by the roadside. This divide between rich and poor crops up in some of the old myths, like the story from Duloc in County Mayo, where 400 starving people are said to have been swept into the lake and drowned because the wealthy landowners turned them away. The story isn't entirely true, but it's been put to good use. Every year, the Irish charity AFRI organises a famine walk along the route the starving people are said to have taken. The purpose of the walk isn't just to remember the poor Irish people who died, but to encourage awareness that millions of poor people in the world today are still suffering the horrors of hunger and despair. What the poor need more than charity is justice. And I suppose what we're trying to do in terms of this great famine project is to ensure that it's not just about looking back at the past uh, and, and just remembering the pain of the past, that if we believe what happened to our people in the past was wrong, then it's equally wrong if it's happening to any other human being, and of course it is. And so I think that we've got to then look at what are our responsibilities as Irish people uh, in relation to the poor and the hungry throughout Asia, Africa and Latin America today. Irish charities like Concern and Trokara were very active in famine relief during the recent tragedy in Somalia. The Irish president, Mary Robinson, was the only Western leader to make a personal visit to see for herself the sufferings of the people and the efforts of Irish charities to relieve them. The president also opened the Irish Famine Museum at Strokestown Park in the summer of 1994. As countries grow more prosperous, as they move more confidently towards modern statehood, the temptation is not, despite the accepted wisdom, to dwell on the past, but to try to escape it, to forget its defeat, its sorrow, and the terrible reminder it offers to us all of just how precarious life is. Remembering the suffering... President Robinson is patron of the Famine Museum because she believes that it holds important lessons for the Irish people today. Mrs. Robinson also believes that Ireland's own history gives her a sympathetic understanding of the problems faced by poor countries in the modern world. And I think that Ireland does have quite a unique position as a member of the European Union, geographically located in Western Europe, in you know, the Richmond's Club for a lot of the world's perception, and we are a reasonably prosperous country. But our experience has been that of a colony striving for independence and of a country devastated by appalling famine. And that is part of our subconscious. It has been something we've had to, and I believe still have to, fully come to steadfast terms with.
honour, respect and grow forward from and do it in a way that gives us a particular understanding of developing countries. I think we have that. I think that's one of the reasons why so many Irish people, priests, nuns, aid workers, nurses, teachers, work in developing countries and do it in the right way, do it with a commitment to empowering, to helping, to building up the strengths of the communities they work with. We'll send them, we'll send the one with the yellow dress over to you, because I don't think she needs to come in. Can you help me? Workers for the Irish charity Concern during the Somali famine exemplified this approach. Ironically, just as most of the frontline relief during the Irish famine was done by private charities, not government agencies, so it is today in much of the third world. In Don Mullen's words, it's not charity the poor need, but justice. At least 300,000 people died here, most of them children. The charity workers do a heroic job, but when I look at the pictures of starving children today, I can't help feeling that we've learned very little in the last 150 years. <laughs>